Uh, we started a series last week on the Beatitudes. It's been, um, this has been the most challenging and encouraging series that I've ever prepped for. It's, it's, um, it's been really, really powerful for me. And we have these journals that go along with it. We gave all of them away last week. So we have 100 more this week if you didn't get one on the way in. It's just to go a little bit deeper into each beatitude, and they're free. Take one with you. Um, and, and there's also some message notes from, the, uh, from the, the sermons each week in there as well. So take that with you. And last week we looked at really the beatitudes as a whole and what they mean. So there's eight uh, we kind of gave the who, what, where, when, and why. We took the five W's of journalism approach. And uh, so we know that this was known as the Sermon on the Mount. So it's the best sermon by the best preacher that's ever lived, Jesus himself. And he sits down right on the edge of Galilee and begins to teach. And the Sermon on the Mount, so this is a continuous teaching. The Beatitudes really tee it up, and it's the first 10, 12 verses. Um, but Jesus really deals with all of life's greatest issues. And that's what I love about the Bible. That's what I love about this series is it really doesn't, it goes into the bad days of our life, right? You know, a lot of times we, we come to church and we talk about the good days and we talk about the mountaintop experiences and we talk about the good things and that's a big part of it. But I'm finding that the, the real purpose I feel like of the church is, is, is to show me how to live when I'm, when I'm having a bad day, right? Does this stuff work when things aren't going well? Does the Bible work? Can I apply the Bible to my life when I'm going through a situation that I, I don't want to be going through? And so the, the Beatitudes, you know, they all, there's, each one starts with a, with a blessing, that word blessed. And we talked a little bit about that word last week. But, but some translations, depending on what you're reading, it may say happy. So happy is the person who is poor in spirit. Happy are the meek. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. But today's topic, our, our text today, is verse 4. So we're just going to read this, this verse and then we're going to jump in. And, and it doesn't make a bit of sense. So happy, blessed, are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And that's a bit of an of a oxymoron, right? Happy are those who mourn. That doesn't make sense to me in my mind. So let's, let's talk about that for a little bit. The Beatitudes, what I'm finding as I'm digging a little bit more and researching, is that they really all build on one another. And so last week we talked about being poor in spirit. And that basically means that we're not trusting in our, our religious knowledge or trusting in religion or our own, what we've done to, to have an encounter with God or to get to heaven. That it's really more about what he's done. And so when we come to God, we, we know that we're spiritually bankrupt. We know there's not much that we can offer God. Uh, we know that everything that's been done for us, when we stand before God, it's going to be, if we hear well done, it's because we've trusted in what God has done for us, not so much in what we've done. So we don't trust in works. And so blessed are the poor in spirit means, you know, blessed are the, the spiritually bankrupt because they're going to they're gonna stay hungry, right? They're going to keep reaching for God. And so the next step would be those that, are, that, that, that have that mindset in life, there would be some mourning involved. There's going to be some times of grief. And, and so when he says, blessed are those who mourn, there's like three different levels of that. And we're going to talk about just one today. But blessed are those who mourn would be the person who does look in the mirror and say, there's, there's areas in my life where I know I don't measure up. There's areas in my life spiritually where I know I'm, I, I can grow. There's things in me that I know I, if, I wish they weren't there, right? Paul, Paul said it like this in Romans 7, verse, verse 24. He talks about, oh, wretched man that I am. I've got this body of death, that's what he called it. This, this, I've got this part of me that always does the wrong thing, <laughs> Yeah, right, and right, right, there's 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 the, the good part of me, but it seems like the bad part of me is always there. And he talks about this struggle with good and bad. Young, the, the psychologist called it kind of like integrating your shadow. You know that there's things in you that you wish weren't there, but they're there. Paul, he said it's a thorn in his flesh. He prayed, but it, but but it but it never went away. And so we mourn. We we there's there's times where I'll grieve in my own life on, on areas where I know I'm, I'm weak or areas where I know I'm, I'm falling short. So that's what he means. That's the first level of that. Blessed is the person who can see that in their life. 
that knows, okay, I know my shortcomings, I know my, and, it, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not proud of it. And the second level would be kind of this mourning that we feel or experience, and maybe you have as well, this heaviness when we look at the world. Like when you turn on news, like, like it, the crisis sells, right? We're not, they're not like showing people rescuing puppies on Fox News and CNN. Like, like they may have like 10 minutes of that. And then it's wars and rumors of wars. It's plagues, it's fighting, it's, it's violence, and, and that's what gets our attention. And so that's, that's kind of what we see. But, but as a whole, when we look at the world, I, I know you've felt it. When you hear about tragedies and you hear about the wars that are happening right now and wars that could be happening, and we, we look out at the world and there's a mourning. There's a, like, you know, we just we kind of know that this is not the way that God intended it to be. Right? There's something deep down inside of us that, that, that speaks that to us. When we, when we see these things and we see the evil in the world, we can't deny that it's there. There's this mourning that takes place. Luke chapter 19, verse 41 says, Jesus was looking over the city of Jerusalem and he wept. Because it wasn't the way that his father intended it to be. And, and the world is not set right right now. And so there are things that, that shouldn't be there. And so, there, so we look at the world and there's this mourning that happens inside of us, this sorrow. Isaiah 53, we know that Jesus was a man of sorrow and he, he experienced that weightiness. And as Christians, we would experience that when we see the, the, just some of the crazy stuff that happens in the world. And then the third meaning of this, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted, would just be mourning over loss in our own personal life. And, it, and that's, that's universal. Everybody in here is going to face a, a loss, pain. Jesus said it like this, that it rains on the just and the unjust. Right? That, that we're all going to go through things. We're going to do things for the last time. We're going to talk to people for the last time. We're going to have coffee with someone for the last time. And so how, how do we heal from loss? How do we walk through it? And what do we do with our bad days? And I'm so glad that the Bible talks about this. Like, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so glad that there's not like a gray area and just, hey, just deal with it. It'll get better. You know what I'm saying? Like, just pour some Robitussin on it. You got a broke leg. Just pour some, some NyQuil on it. It'll get better. Just keep going. Like, like, the Bible talks deeply about what to do when we're going through bad situations, when we're hurting. And the world, a lot of times, that's the analogy they take. Like, you, you've got some really bad things going on in your life, and it says, well, just, just get over it. Or, well, it could be worse, right? Have you heard that before? That's, that's probably not a good thing to say to somebody that's having a bad day. It could be worse, you know, your dog and your cat could have got ran over. You know what I mean? Like, I, like, I mean, so there's different ways for different people to deal with this stuff. But I want to read you this, this verse, and this is, it, when Jesus was teaching the Beatitudes on the Sermon of the Mount, the best sermon by the best preacher, Jesus spoke Aramaic. And so our Bible, the Bible that you have, was, is, is translated from Aramaic to Greek in the New Testament, and then from Greek to English. So we're like three languages out. But this, this Aramaic scholar translated Matthew 5 verse 4 like this. Turn to the source are those who are feeling deeply confused by life. Mourning. They shall be returned from their wandering. I thought, man, that captured it. What does it feel like when you're having a bad day? When you go through pain and loss, it feels deeply confusing. It feels like, well, what have I done to, do, to, deserve, to, to deserve this? Is, is, am I doing something wrong? Did somebody else do something wrong? And I think before we jump into this, we, we got we to gotta deal with that one issue right there. Does God cause our bad days? Is this something I've done? Did, did God, is God sending judgment to my home, to my house? And, and so we, we entertain all these thoughts in our mind. And I don't believe that God causes your bad days. But I do believe he can use them. And in a world full of evil, in a world full of pain, we're going to have bad days, we're going to go through loss. And I don't, I don't believe that God is capable of evil. When he created this world, it was perfect. And we know the story, sin entered in. And, and so bad days and pain and loss, it's not something you've done. It's not something your neighbor did. It's not something God did. We just live in a fallen world. And bad days are going to be a part of it. And, and, and so God doesn't cause them, but he'll use them. And, and so these are three things I believe that have helped me. When, when bad days come, there's three things that they can do. 
the first thing they can do is they can, they can point us to the true source of comfort. Because I'm noticing that the, our world is full of hurting people right now, and they're trying, they're trying to numb the pain. They're trying to find some kind of comfort. They're trying to just some kind of ease to the suffering and what they're walking through. And, and there's a lot of options out there, right? That are offering comfort and offering a little bit of a, a relief from the pressure and the strain. But when we walk through bad days, it opens this door to God. And it, and it opens this door where we can tr really truly experience the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And there's a difference between relief and restoration. There's a difference between just finding some relief to the pain I'm in and, and the bad day that I'm having. And so there's all kinds of comfort for that. There's like Southern comfort, right? There's, uh, there's Netflix, there's binging, there's overworking, right? I'm, I'm having a bad day. I just went through this loss. So I'm just going to go back to work and forget it, like just distract myself. In, in the corporate America, if you lose an immediate family member, the amount of time they give you on average is three days. Like a dad or a mom or a son or daughter, like three days. And there's no way that you're able to fully heal and be comforted and, 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 ex and go through the process that you need that, that quickly. But, but that's what we try to do, right? Some people get busy. Right? I'm just going to stay busy and not think about it. And, and, but the Bible says when we are overwhelmed, let me read this to you. Psalm 61, David prayed this prayer. When my, when my heart is overwhelmed from the ends of the earth, God, I'm going to cry to you. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. And so he turned to God on his bad days. He didn't turn to just, you know, temporary comfort. He didn't, you know, and there's those things are out there and sometimes they provide a little bit of relief. But what we really want is restoration. What we really want is, is God to, to heal our hearts. And I'm finding in my life where I go when I'm in pain determines what leads me. I'll say that again. When I'm having a bad day, what I turn to determines what leads my life. And so if I'm turning to temporary comfort over and over and over, what, what I was using to just get through something has now got shackles on me. And it's become unhealthy. And so we want to turn to the true source of comfort. Can I, can I get an amen? True, true source of comfort. The next thing that, that are, uh, our bad days do for us is they can develop character inside of us. There's lessons that we'll only learn going through the valley. There's lessons that we cannot learn on the mountain, right? There's... A calm sea has never produced a skilled sailor. We have to go through storms in life. And when we do, what it can do is it can grow us. It can, it can strengthen us. Uh, James says it like this, James chapter 1, consider it pure joy, right? You should be happy and clapping when you, whenever you face trials of many kinds. This is why, because you know that when you go through a test and you have a bad day, there's an opportunity there. It can develop perseverance in you. And then once perseverance is, is built inside of you and it has its work, you can be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Not in your notes. Psalm 119, verse 71. It was good for me, the, the writer said, the psalmist said, that I was afflicted. Why? Because I learned lessons in the valley that I couldn't learn on the mountain. And that suffering and going through trials is a part of the way that God grows us and develops us. Uh, my cousin, when I was growing up, he had this, this shirt. He liked to work out a lot. Clearly, I didn't get that genetic from him. That gene, but he, he was a like, bodybuilder, and he did some professional bodybuilding. And, and um, he had this shirt that said, The Lord's Gym. And on the back of it said, No pain, no gain. And I thought that that's true. That's true for life. That when we have bad days and we go through situations where their pain is involved, it's, a, it's an opportunity, right? It's an opportunity for growth. And here's the last one. They can really reveal, when I, go have, when I have bad days, they can truly reveal the closeness of God. I believe God is near when we're in the valley. That, that, and I don't know why. But I, and I don't know if it's maybe we're more aware, if he's just, he's, I know he's everywhere at all times, but it, maybe we listen a little deeper, and because we're, we're going through a trial, or we're going through something, we're more focused, but God is near. And I think he goes out of his way to show up when people are facing trials in their life, 
to comfort them, to remind them that he's there, to remind them that that's, that's not the end of the story. The writer says it like this, Psalm 34, verse 18, that the Lord is close. He's near to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Aren't you glad that you serve a God who's not afraid of your bad days? Aren't you glad that you serve a God who not only that, it's almost like when he knows you're having a, 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 a bad day, it's like he, he, he steps in and he, he offers his presence in a more unique way. Just, just, just you know that you're not alone when you go through it. So how do we move? We have a promise in this verse that it's not a matter of if bad days are going to come. It's, it's when they come. And there's different things that we can do. I mean, I mean, we can just avoid it altogether. We can deny it. I mean, I'm okay, right? Fake it till, I, till you make it. I'm just going to put, put on the, my happy church face and not let anybody know what's going on in my life. I, don't, I think that, that could be the opposite of mourning. You know, when I think of the opposite of mourning, it, it's not laughter. It's, it's, it's denying what you're really feeling. It's repressing those things. It's, it's not giving them space. And so I don't think that that ends very well at all. And in the Bible, there's a story that I, I, I think captures every part of a bad day and what grief is really like when we walk through situations of loss. And it's the story of Lazarus, and many of you are probably very familiar with it. But it's amazing. There's, it's about 30 verses or so, so we're not going to read it all. But it goes through almost every stage of grief is represented in that story. And, and there's five stages of grief. Some of you can probably tell them to me, and you know what it is, but maybe you don't. And when we have a bad day, there's, there's these different stages that, that science has told us, or the medical industry or field has given us these five stages. And I think they're good so that you can recognize them. You know, and the first stage, they say, is like d denial. You just, like it didn't happen. I'm not even going to, I'm going to just act like this didn't happen. I can't, I can't process this right now. And then there's like anger, right? We get mad. We get mad at the situation. We get mad at God. God, where are you at? There's the bargaining. Like, maybe I can pray my way out of this one, right? <laughs> maybe if I pray hard enough that this, this situation will go away or they'll get healed or this won't happen. And, and so we start to bargain with God and maybe I can make a deal with God. And then there's the low point, right? The depression. We just feel really bad and just want to kind of be alone. And then there's acceptance, and I wish that these stages like, like worked like a formula, and I don't believe they do. <laughs> and you've been through loss. I don't have to talk to anyone in here about loss because every one of you have experienced some kind of loss. It, it doesn't show up in order, right? You may be, you know, once you walk through a really, really bad day and you have to put somebody in the grave too soon or someone's sick or leaves you or hurts you and, and you, you don't know how to deal with it and process it and you get months down the road and you feel like I'm doing pretty good and then all, all of a sudden it just shows back up and you're mad. Or you're driving down the road and you're listening to a song and it reminds you of something and then you're sad. And so grief, I think, is different for every person. But it does have one similarity. It's like that alcoholic uncle that just shows up unannounced and he smokes cigarettes in your house and you just want him to leave, okay? Like, like he shows up at ball games and gets rowdy and gets in fights and unannounced and like everybody's afraid to get around Uncle Billy or whatever. Or, you know, like, like it, it, nobody likes grief. There's not a person on the planet that I've sat down with or anyone that, well, I love to grieve. It's something I just look forward to. You know what I mean? Like, no, it's that part of our life that just we don't like it. Nobody wants to be around grief. It's not comfortable walking in rooms where that's going on and, and people are experiencing pain and loss. It's, it's not easy. But I believe that there's hope when we go through those days. And that God has not just given us relief, but he wants to give us the cure. He wants to heal our hearts in those areas of our life. And and so just, just a couple of things from the story of Lazarus. So Lazarus dies. We know Lazarus was very close to Jesus. They were friends. He stayed at the house. They, I mean, they were, they were tight. They sent word to Jesus that Lazarus was sick and he didn't come. Right? Not only did he wait one day, he waited two days. Then he waited three days and then four days. Like, surely Jesus, this guy that we've given up everything to follow, is going to come and help out his friend, but he doesn't. And so he lets several days go by. So Lazarus ends up dying. And he shows up. Here's Jesus, Pastor Jesus. 
he misses the hospital visitation. <laughs> he misses the scheduling, the viewing, and he misses the funeral. And he's like four days late. And so when he shows up, I want, you to, I want you to see this right out of the gate. Verse 20, Martha and Mary, Lazarus had two sisters, and they were not real happy with Jesus. And it says, when Jesus showed up, Martha heard that Jesus was coming. Verse 20, she went out to meet him. But Mary wouldn't even go out to the house. So Mary, I think Mary was in the house, and she was upset. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Now, I'm glad that's there for a lot of reasons. Number one, it shows me that they had the kind of relationship with Jesus that they could talk straight with him. This, I don't think these are words of, of faith. I think these are words of pain. These are words of anger. These are, you know, Jesus, we sure have done a lot for you. And, you know, you said that you were the son of God and you said that, that if, if we believe in you, we would never die. And we sent like a messenger pigeon to you like six days ago. I don't know how they communicated back then uh, to let you know that Lazarus was sick. And now here you are showing up way too late. And if you would have been here, you ever felt like that before? You ever got mad at God? When somebody dies too soon and you prayed and you fasted, you did all the right stuff, but he didn't show up. I'm glad that's there. I'm glad that's there because I think the first step to move from mourning to comfort is we've got to recognize what we're feeling and tell the truth to somebody. Martha didn't show up and say, bless God, Jesus, I'm glad you're here. Lazarus is dead, but I'm fine. I'm okay. I got my Sunday best on. Let's just go act like it didn't happen. You know what I mean? Like, like let's just push through this and rush through this and get on with life. That's not what she did. She told him the truth. She, she, I mean, I'm sure with pain and tears in her eyes, Jesus, if you would have been here, Meister Eckhart, he was a pastor from or priest actually from like 16 1700s he said god is the denial of denial and the first step i think to dealing with things in our life bad days is just to give it space and feel what you need to feel if it's anger get angry if it's if it's if you're sad get sad right um if 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 there's bargaining that needs to happen bargain but i think the worst thing we can do is just try to shove it in the closet and move on like it didn't happen because the pain that we don't process we end up projecting either at ourselves or the people that we love and it just comes out in all these weird times like thanksgiving and christmas and, and like and when, and when the family's around and you just just hit somebody in the jaw at thanksgiving and you're like i don't know why that happened but uh you did this to me seven years ago do you remember that you know it was may 3rd in 1998 and it comes out it's going to come out at some point but but when we grieve and we allow the grief and the thing about grief is it is different for everyone. Somebody sent me this. I want to read it to you. It says that grief is like surfing. You ready for this? Except you're blindfolded in a hurricane. And your surfboard's on fire. And the people on the shore are shouting strategies for a storm that they've never served. And then they're shaking their heads at how you handle the waves. Oftentimes, if we are in that situation and you're Jesus showing up to a home and people are grieving, the darker the situation, the less you should say. People just need you to be with them. It's presence. Just sit with them. Just be there. Let them say what they need to say. Let them process what they need to process. Let them get mad at you. Martha was mad and she let Jesus know. She recognized the pain. She didn't internalize it. And then here, here's, here's the second thing that happened. She began to cry, right? Here's this next day. She, when, verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews that had come along with her also weeping, Jesus was deeply moved. And he asked her a question. He asked Martha a question. Where have you laid him? And then Martha gives this invitation. You got to see this. Come and see, Lord. And so the first interaction is, if you'd have been here, Jesus, my brother wouldn't have died. You could probably, you know, it was very abrasive. 
but now there's, there's more happening here. I, I believe what, what, what I'm seeing is that she's inviting Jesus into what she's experiencing. Why would you want to go to the grave, right? Like, they're, she's already crying, they're already upset, they're already mad. I, to me, in my mind, that would be going from bad to worse. It's very fresh. It just happened. Why is Jesus asking her to take him to the place where she gave up? And oftentimes, when we really go through the grief process, and, and we're reaching out to Jesus, we're reaching out to God to help us, he may ask us to go to that place in our life where we might have given up on our faith. We gave up on God. We gave up on life getting any better. We gave up on life ever being the same. And he asked her that question. Now, Jesus doesn't ask questions just to ask questions. Y'all know that, right? Like, he asks questions because he knows the answer, but he wants, them, he wants to get the answer out of them. And so when he asks a question, I have to ask myself, what's the question behind the question? Jesus is asking her to lead him to the place of her greatest pain. And I think that there's some areas of our life, there's some things that we walk through that only God can bring healing. And sometimes it comes in weird ways. Sometimes it, 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 we have to go back to where it happened. Sometimes we have to, to, to be, be willing to walk into the dark places and stare the grief in the face and not act like it's not there and be willing to face it. And I think that's what Jesus is doing here. Because I want you to know this, God cares about your pain. He doesn't waste it. Pain is never wasted in the kingdom of God. See, there's good pain and there's bad pain. We're more familiar with the bad pain, right? We don't like bad pain. We want to medicate it and numb it. But there's good pain. There's good pain that leads to purpose. There's good pain that leads to healing, right? And, and, and so I don't think Jesus is doing this to Martha. Take me to the grave so we can cry some more and you can hurt some more just for the sake of it. He's doing it because he knows that if she's willing to take him there, that there's, there's, there's healing that's going to come through that. Her being willing to face it, just, just look it right in the face. But she reaches out to Jesus in the process. I'm going to read this last piece here, and I'd never caught this until studying for this. And there's 20 or 30 verses about Lazarus, and I want you to notice who showed up first. And this is interesting to me. John 11, verse 19, many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. Look at verse 31. The Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed when she got up when Jesus asked and, and called for her. Never caught this. But I do know for sure, <laughs> when you're walking through seasons of, of life, when you are grieving and you're walking through that bad day, God is always going to have somebody there for you to lean into. The worst thing that, in the worst place that you can be when you're having a bad day is alone. Nobody should go through bad days alone. Nobody should go through loss alone. And that's, to me, the beauty of the church. That's the beauty of community. Now, here they are. We don't know if, these, if, if they were a part of this synagogue or not. But the Jews showed up, the, the church showed up to walk this family through their loss. And I think as a, as a church, as a Christian, that's one of the greatest honors that we can be given is to be there for someone when they're having a bad day. But not only that, 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 that we know that there's people there around us <laughs> that, that's going to cry with us, that's going to laugh with us, that's going to hear the stories. And so I would say when, when you're going through these situations to move from mourning to comforting is you got to rely on the trustworthy people that God has placed around you because they're there. And they may not be right out of the gate and it may come through someone that you may not like because the Jews didn't have a, you know, Jesus got mad at one group of people <laughs> and it was the religion, it was the Jews, right? Like he, that, he fashioned a whip, showed up at the, at the synagogue, flipped over tables but here we see these Jewish, this Jewish community gathering around them to comfort them. And so it's not so much what you go through in life, it's, it's who's with you when you go through it. And somebody needs to know, somebody needs to be there. And I believe with all my heart, God has placed people around you. That's why I'm, I'm so, 
I mean, I know you get tired of hearing it, <laughs> but I think small groups are so important for that reason. Like that you've got people in your life that know you, that you can call, they can call you when stuff is happening. You've, you've got their cell phone number. If you're in a small group, you should exchange cell phone numbers. People should know how to get a hold of you. You should know how to, to get a hold of them. Why? Because you never know when a bad day may come, may come knocking and you want to lean into those relationships. Yeah, there's going to be times where you're going to be alone. Yeah, there's going to be times where I'm sure you're going to want to pull away from people. But when you're going through a bad day, the most dangerous tactic of the enemy is to isolate us. Because then we start believing things that aren't real. Then he starts shooting those fiery darts and putting thoughts in our minds that aren't real. Like this is never going to get better. And, and, and life is just, oh, like, like you know how he works. And you, and you know the, the tactics that he uses. And when you've got people around you, it's like a shield of faith. Come on, somebody. It's like, it's like they can take the darts. They can let you know when you're not thinking clear. Like, like they, they can help, help you find truth and find perspective when you're just confused. All right. Now that I got you real good and depressed. <laughs> Blessed are those who mourn. That's the object. Why? Because they will be comforted. This is the promise that I'm going to share, and I'm just going to read the verse, and then we're going to pray. This is what separates every single religion on the face of the earth from Christianity. It said every person that is a Christian, we don't grieve the same way that the world grieves. Because we have hope in our very, very darkest, worst days. The Bible reminds us over and over and over that we're kind of living in this story and we're just in one chapter of it, right? And we're living in a time right now that's kind of crazy. <laughs> you know, it does really feel like the book of Revelation some days. It's like, and we're living in the last days. And even a person who's not a Christian will tell you that right now, we, for sure. It's the end, I know it is, right? Like, like we, we know that, but we know it's just one chapter in the whole book. That no matter what I face on this side of eternity, there's always more. There's always something else on the other side of this pain that I'm facing. And that pain, I don't want you to take on like a pathology of pain. God's never called us to live in pain, but it's kind of the doorway to purpose. The cross is like the national emblem, right, for Christianity. It's on top of churches. It's on the sides of buildings. Why? It's not where we live. We, Jesus didn't live on the cross. He visited the cross. And it was a moment of pain to get him to his ultimate destiny. Are you hearing me? That it, it, it was just the doorway to, to what God had coming. It was just the doorway to resurrection. It was the doorway to hope. It was the doorway to comfort. It's the mourning and the suffering and the grieving that ushers in and invites the presence and the peace and the purpose of God. And so how does it all end? No matter, if I could sit down with you and hear your story right now, it may seem like it's a, it's a tragedy right now. Shakespeare wrote two different types of plays. <laughs> Tragedies and comedies, right? He kept it real simple. You knew it was either going to end really, really bad, <laughs> like it really bad, or it was going to end really, really good. And so much of life comes to us like a story. It's not a math problem. It's not an equation. You can't figure it out. It's a story. And sometimes you just got to stay in it to get through it. And it's in those chapters where you just don't want to read anymore. I, 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 this is sad. <laughs> this hurts. But this is the last page of the book. This is where we're all heading. If you're a believer this morning, this is how your story is going to end. Revelation 21. I want to read the verse, and I hope you can get happy about this. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he's going to live with them. We're not going to have to come to church anymore. We're not going to listen to this annoying redneck preacher anymore, okay? There's going to be a time where you're going to go straight to God and you're going to talk to him like we're talking right now. And they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Listen to this. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death, no more mourning, 
Come on, somebody. No more death. No more mourning. No more crying. Why? For the old order of things have passed away. It's just a season. It's just a step. It's just a chapter. So I want you to just bow your head, close your eyes, and I want to pray this morning. I want to pray for those that, that maybe you're, you're having your bad day right now. And you're, you're, you're dealing with the, the sting of loss. And you've wondered if life would ever be back to normal, if that's even going to be in, the, in your future. You've wondered if you'd ever be happy again. And I want to promise you that joy is coming. <laughs> That weeping may endure for a night. It's just a season. It's like the tide. It's like waves. They come and they go. We go through seasons of mourning and we go through seasons of loss and grief. But we walk through the valley. Why? Because there's something greater on the other side. There's restoration. There's healing. There's resurrection. So if you're here and you're, you're just you're walking through a bad day and you, or a bad week or a bad month, and I just want to pray for the comfort of the Holy Spirit to be with you. Because sometimes there's not a cure for pain and you, you can't really get rid of it. But I believe the presence of God, it just lifts us above our circumstances. There's a peace that God will give us. He will give you where you don't have to understand why, what, where, when, how. You don't have to answer all the questions that you've had in your mind. But it just gives you a peace to let you know it's going to be okay. This too will pass. And you're going to come out on the other side stronger. You're going to come out on the other side with a testimony. And you're going to be able to help someone who's in the situation you're in right now. You just got to hold on to the hand of Jesus, that unseen hand. And so, Lord, I just pray right now that your comfort would fill every heart and every life in this room. It's a peace that comes from another world. We can't get it on, we can't get it at the supermarket. We can't get it from a doctor. We can't get it from a psychologist. We can't get it from a friend. But there's a peace that comes from another world that comforts our hearts and our soul. It's the Spirit of God that, that just lets us know that everything is going to work out. And so, Lord, we pray for that peace today. Lord, I pray for that peace for every person here that's going through loss or going through pain. And, and then, God, I pray for just a, a glimpse. I think hope is birthed in the future. So give us a glimpse, Lord, of what is on the other side. Lord, help us to set our soul's anchor in heaven. Knowing that we're in this world right now, but we're not of it. We're just passing through. And that every day we're one step closer <laughs> to that perfect place. And God, what a promise that we have. So this is what I want you to do. Just in your, just pray this in your own heart and spirit. Say, say, Holy Spirit, I pray for your comfort. Jesus, I pray for your peace. And God, I ask for your vision to fill my heart, to fill my soul. Give me a glimpse of the future you have for me. Let me anchor my soul in heaven's shore. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen.